Okay, hello everyone. Uh, today we're going to give a lecture on energy storage, and with me is Su Min, who's going to help me with this lecture. We mind saying hello? Hello. <laughs> Great. So, let's get started. Uh, so, today's lecture is really just going to be an overview of uh, various energy storage technologies. So, this is the list of technologies that we're going to discuss. Uh, I've categorized them in four different categories. They are mechanical energy storage, thermal energy storage, electromagnetic energy storage, and chemical energy storage. Let me also mention that this list is not comprehensive. Uh, there's other storage technologies out there, but I think this covers uh, the most common ones that you will come across. Now, um, as we move forward, I'm going to try my best to present all these energy storage technologies in a unified way. Uh, this allows you to compare across different energy storage technologies. Now, let me preface this by saying that some of these technologies are quite different in nature, so it is a little hard and I'm forcing a uh, unified way to think about them. So, uh, I apologize for that. Uh, but, but as we go forward, I think this will really help you organize uh, these different technologies. So I'm going to present uh, four things for each technology. First, generally how it works, just to give you an idea of how this technology works. Uh, the second is we're going to talk about what is the reservoir or uh, the stock, and what is the level variable corresponding to that stock or reservoir. And then associated with that, what is the state equation or the differential equation uh, that governs the evolution of energy in this storage technology. Third, we'll talk about some basic technical specifications. Most of these come from a, um, an article by Bradbury, which is in uh, B courses under files. So you can refer uh, to that reference to get most of the numbers for these energy storage technologies. Then we're going to talk about just some general advantages and disadvantages. Let me be clear here. We're talking in general kind of hand wavy terms about what are the advantages and disadvantages. This is just to help with uh, discussion and intuition. Uh, so with that, let's dive right in. Um, but first, let me uh, talk about some general aspects about energy storage technologies. So the first thing to talk about is the so-called Rigoni plot. The Rigoni plot is a way to um, think about different types of energy storage technologies with respect to two different characteristics, namely specific energy and specific power. Uh, that is, what is um, how much energy can these devices store per unit mass, and how much power can they consume or produce per unit mass? Okay. Now, in this plot, you can see a variety of energy storage uh, technologies. Uh, let me highlight first that gasoline, which you're probably familiar with if you drive a car. Uh, you can see that, generally speaking, these have high specific energy. Of course, this is why gasoline dominates as the energy storage technology for human and goods transport. Right? They have, they have very high specific energy, so it makes sense um, why this is the dominant technology today. Uh, conversely, you have uh, technologies which are relatively poor in terms of specific energy, but have great peak power. Um, these are things like supercapacitors or, or flywheels. So they can give a burst of power, um, but they can't store um, a, lo a lot of energy per unit uh, mass. Okay, So they make a little less sense uh, for mobile applications, but for stationary or high power uh, applications uh, where, where you don't need to store a lot of energy, they can make um, a lot of sense. So this Rigoni plot is a real nice way to sort of think about the spectrum of energy storage technologies. Okay, let me remind you of this picture. Uh, these are really business use cases for energy storage. So as I discussed a few lectures ago in class, uh, there's five levels of uh, business use cases for energy storage in power systems. Uh, so starting at the smallest scale, you have uh, residential use. This is behind the meter, and primarily the business case here is for backup power uh, in case the grid uh, goes out, right, in case there, there's an outage. That's, that's really the main business case 
uh, today and in the past. Uh, moving up one level, you have at the commercial scale, you have energy storage that's again behind the meter. These are typically used to uh, offset demand charges. Um, then moving up another level, we have uh, energy storage used in microgrids. These might be in front of uh, an individual electricity ratepayer's meter. Uh, this is energy storage that's used to help uh, integrate renewables in, in a microgrid uh, setting. So, so this will really be used for energy balancing. Then uh, at, at level number two, at the distribution level, this is energy storage that can assist with providing uh, voltage support, um, uh, typically at the substation level. And then at the highest level, we have peak replacement. This is energy storage that's uh, um, used typically just for those few times of the year that uh, we have peak power consumption, peak electric power consumption. And this is often during the summer uh, where it's a hot day, we have a lot of air conditioning loads, and we often have to have uh, typically these gas-fired, natural gas-fired peak or power plants that are only dispatched a few times a year to meet these very high peak loads. These are now uh, starting to be replaced, especially in California, with uh, battery energy storage. Okay, these are the business use cases. I don't want to go into too much detail. And again, I'll just remind you, there's this very nice report um, um, by the Rocky Mountain Power Institute that talks about 13 business economic values for energy storage. Uh, you can see backup power there. You can see demand charge reduction. You can see spinning and non-spinning reserves for uh, peaker power plant replacement. This class is not a business class, so I don't want to go into detail, uh, but I do want to refer you uh, to this report because it can be very nice if you want to understand business uh, cases for um, energy storage. But let me move forward because today's lecture is really about energy storage technologies. So uh, let's dive into the category of mechanical energy storage. By the way, Sumin, if you want to jump in with a question yeah. or something that's of interest, feel feel free. Feel Thank free. You. Thank you. Great. So uh, the first one I want to talk about is probably the most prevalent energy storage technology in the grid today worldwide. And this is pumped hydro storage. Uh, and in concept, this is actually incredibly simple. So imagine that you have, um, you know, some elevation change. And you have two reservoirs, one at a lower elevation, one at a higher elevation. The way this works is as follows. When you have excess uh, power production, then what you could do is run some pumps to pump water from, from the lower reservoir up to the higher reservoir. Okay, so the pumps are consuming energy and they're basically storing that as gravitational potential energy by moving water up to a higher uh, reservoir. Then when you want to discharge energy from the storage device, you'll allow the water to run downhill and turn turbines which can produce uh, electricity. So in short, our form of energy capacity is just the gravitational potential energy equation. E equals mgh, where h is the height of the reservoir. Now, in this case, the level variable is going to be the mass of water that we have in this high-level reservoir. In other words, if we have no water in the high-level reservoir, then we have no energy storage. Right? So then, uh, the differential equation will basically be the derivative of mH. Um, and if we multiply that by gH, which is basically the time derivative of energy stored, we have... Uh, the mass flow rate of water times the gravitational constant, um, the height difference between these two reservoirs, and then we also have any sort of frictional losses from this uh, entire system. So uh, that's, that's how it works, and it's the most prevalent type of energy storage technology in the grid today. 
So you might ask, what is a round-trip energy efficiency? Uh, depending on the technology, it can be anywhere between, roughly speaking, 70 to 85 percent. The response time, this is basically the time that it takes um, to get a step change in electric power um, relative to the time that you command that step change. So this could be typically on the order of tens of seconds or maybe minutes, and that has to do with waiting for water to flow through the system. And then I'm also going to give statistics or numbers on the specific energy and power, the energy density and power density. Now, now in this case, uh, really this is di dictated by the size of the reservoir, uh, the type of generators that you have, and the energy and power density, that is the unit energy and the unit power per unit volume. <laughs> now, given that this is you know, distributed across an elevation change, it's, it's limited by your environment. Okay. Um, so you, you would typically use this type of energy storage technology when you have the, the appropriate mountainous geographic features and you're not too worried about, you know, density or weight, right? Because, uh, uh, um, you know, those, those uh, features don't, uh, aren't really important when you're considering pumped hydro storage. Some advantages are it has very low maintenance costs. We basically just have pumps and generators. And it's a simple, well-understood design. So there's not much research involved in getting this out there. It's a proven technology that's been operating for uh, decades. In fact, if anyone's ever played the game SimCity, <laughs> that was actually produced in, uh, I think the original version came out in the late 80s. Um, I played it in the early 90s. And uh, it's kind of funny because that game, or at least the version I played, which is SimCity 2000, that you started in the year 1900 and there were two, only two energy generation technologies available to you, power generation technologies, coal and piped, pumped hydro storage. And if you go online and read, how do I build the most efficient city that reduces pollution and all that, basically they advise to you only use pumped hydro storage. Keep in mind, this was in, uh, you know, the game starts in 1900, so this is a century-old technology. Okay, let's move forward to a different type of mechanical energy storage technology, flywheels. Uh, very interesting technology, super simple idea. So, the key is this big rotor. All this rotor is, is a big rotational mass. And this big rotational mass sits in a vacuum, and it rotates. And you want it to be in a vacuum because that means that there's no air drag. So you have no loss of kinetic energy, or at least minimal loss of kinetic energy due to air drag. So you can see there's this vacuum pump which tries to pull out air to make it um, as, as low pressure as uh, possible. Uh, you'll note that this rotor is sitting on... Um, on a, on a crankshaft, if you will, and there's bearings. And these bearings are actually magnetic, and that's super important because you, you want it magnetic to reduce uh, the friction due to rotation. And then on this crankshaft, you have this, this motor, uh, which typically can be large. And um, we say it's a motor when we're storing energy. So what happens is if we have an excess of power, three-phase power, for example, ABC here, then it'll the, the motor will take that electric power, uh, convert it into rotational um, kinetic energy by spinning up this rotor. And that's operating in motor mode. Then this rotor basically just spins indefinitely. There's some losses due to friction and to the bit of... Uh, uh, air pressure that, that exists in, in this vacuum, um, but it generally spins freely. Then, when you want to extract energy out of this system, what you'll do is operate this motor in reverse, and we call that a generator, but it's the exact same hardware. Um, and what it does is it'll apply a torque to slow down this rotor, and in that process, it produces electric power. So it's a, actually a super clean, simple idea Technologically, what makes this work, honestly, is keeping this thing in a vacuum and having these magnetic bearings uh, properly balanced so you can reduce friction. 
So the um, energy storage equation looks as follows. We have E equals one half I omega squared, where I is the rotational inertia. Okay, so it's the rotational mass, rotational inertia of the rotor. Um, actually, of the entire setup, of the entire setup. Uh, then omega is the rotational speed. Okay, um, and uh, correspondingly the amount of energy that's stored in the system is given by omega. And you can understand that well by considering what happens when omega is zero. That means when, when the rotor uh, is not spinning at all, it's just still, then there's no energy, kinetic energy, stored in the system. Right? So, the, so the state equation, or the ordinary differential equation, will basically be the derivative of the energy equation here. Um, and in this case, it's actually just Newton's law but in rotational coordinates, which is known as Euler's equations. Uh, so this is I times angular acceleration, also the time derivative of angular speed. And then you have the sum of the torques. And the torques uh, will be the torque imposed by the motor generator. So when it's positive torque, the motor is spinning up uh, the rotor. And when it's negative torque, the motor is in generator mode and pulling energy out of the system. And then we might have some small frictional losses, which we try to keep to a minimum when we design this technology. Yeah. Can this kind of thing be applied to electric vehicles? Is that what the hybrids are like? Yeah. Um, so there's no mass scale electric vehicle that, that uses a flywheel. When people talk about hybrid uh, electric vehicles, uh, it's almost always a battery. Oh. Um, th there has been some concept cars out there that use flywheel uh, t technology, mm. um, uh, but but you can see it's uh, very important to keep this, Stable. you know, in, in a vacuum, mm. and uh, it could be quite heavy, in fact. Mm. So um, mm. as far as uh, volumetric, well, mass energy density, it doesn't have the greatest uh, specifications. So, so we'll talk about that here, actually. So, so the round trip efficiency can be um, actually up to 95%. And the response time is relatively quick, um, at a second or a tenth of a second. And uh, we'll see some other numbers here for specific energy and power and energy density and power density. So the absolute numbers uh, might not be too significant until you get more data points here. But, but let me generally say, the, the power density is relatively high. So when you need a lot of power fast, but you don't need it for a long time, this works quite well. What does kg mean here? Ah, uh, this really is kilograms, so, so just yeah. unit, unit of mass. Yeah, but then kilograms and like gasoline, it makes sense, but for flywheels, what, what's that? Yeah, we're, we're generally talking about um, the weight of this entire setup. Okay. So, so you can, like with gasoline, Mm, makes sense. Yeah, all we have is the liquid fuel. Maybe you can count the tank. You should probably actually count the the engine as well. He, here in this setup, you got to count uh, the vacuum pump. Mm. Um, you know the motor, the generator. So you've got all this like sometimes they call this balance of plant. Okay. Yeah, that's 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 a good question. And frankly, I, I'm not being very specific about what's included in these numbers. You might have to refer to the Bradbury paper. Uh, hopefully they, they, they describe it. So at this level, we're just trying to get a sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, advantages, little to no environmental impact. You can see we're just spinning stuff. So, um, it, and it's a simple, well understood uh, design. So, th so the disadvantages is really it's all about the uh, bearings and keeping it in a vacuum. And it's got excellent power capacity, uh, less so energy capacity. Okay, let's move on to a very different type of mechanical energy storage technology. This is compressed air energy storage. In fact, I should actually categorize this under hydraulic energy storage, uh, not mechanical. So, um, this is a, a little more complex, so let me, let me walk through uh, the stages here. So, I want you to imagine that we have, for example, a wind power plant. And imagine that it's the middle of the night where everyone's asleep and power demand is low. 
but the wind speed is high, so we're generating more power than is being consumed at that moment. So something that we could do is use that excess wind power to run a motor, and what this motor is doing is it's running a compressor that's compressing air. So it's taking air from, um, you know, normal air pressure, uh, for example, at, at, at one bar, um, and it's compressing it uh, to a higher pressure. Now, when you compress air down to a higher pressure, the temperature will simultaneously go up if you keep volume the same. So what we're going to do is, uh, because the temperature of the air goes up as we compress it, we're, we're also going to pull heat out of that compressed air and store it thermally in this device through some sort of heat exchanger. Okay? So, and, and what that allows us to do is actually compress it even further, because then uh, we don't have to worry about it being very high temperature. Then we're going to take that compressed air and we're going to shove it underground. Um, and it's typically in salt caverns. Uh, salt caverns are, you know, voluminous um, uh, spaces underground where we can put very high pressure air um, and it maintains its, uh, you know, geological. Um, uh, you know, structural stability. So it won't damage the cavern, right? It's, 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 it's robust to high pressures. So we're going to store this compressed air in these, under, in these underground salt caverns, and it's stored basically hy hydraulically um, because of the high pressure. Then when we want to extract energy, what we're going to do is uh, pull out air from uh, these salt caverns, and when it gets pulled out, um, we're going to allow it to expand. Now it's going to cool rapidly as it expands. Now we've, we also have this thermal energy storage, which is a part of this whole system. We're going to heat up the expanding air uh, with this thermal energy that we, that we uh, pulled out before so that we can get low pressure air but at high temperature. And then in this bit here, which is basically a type of combustion system, um, there's another loop in here, but but let me just say we're going to take that lower pressure air that's at, that's um, at higher temperatures, and then we're going to put it in some combustion chamber, add some bit of um, combustible fuel, and ignite it, and then we can run a uh, a turbine, some sort of generator, to then uh, create electricity. We can make this more efficient if we take the exhaust gas from this and use it to reheat the incoming air. That's what this loop is, is uh, doing here. So this is compressed air energy storage. It's uh, got a few stages here. Um, but the key thing is we're storing energy hydraulically in these salt caverns. And actually there's a piece where we're pulling out heat and then uh, putting it back in, in, in uh, uh, with this thermal part here. So the energy capacity is basically dictated by the pressure of this compressed air energy storage. So we have E equals the pressure of the air times the volume, where the pressure is what's changing. Um, and here we basically have the ideal gas law. So that's the basic way to, to understand this. And the level variable is going to be given by the pressure. So the amount of pressure in, in the air dictates how much hydraulic energy that, that we're storing. So the state equation is just going to be the time derivative of the energy equation, um, which is dictated uh, by the mass of airflow in uh, minus any sort of uh, losses that, that could occur. So uh, this has a, a less uh, energy efficiency. Uh, you can see there's a lot more pieces here. Um, um, yeah, so it's somewhere between 50 and 85 uh, percent. The response times can be relatively fast. Um, it's basically dictated by how quickly we can spin up uh, uh, combustion in these turbines. Um, so the, um, it, it has relatively low energy and power density. So these are per unit volume. And that makes sense because we're actually storing this underground in these salt caverns. So this doesn't make a lot of sense in a phone. 
doesn't make a lot of sense in a car, um, but it could make sense at a grid scale where you have access to these salt caverns. You don't really care about um, volume. So if you have that type of geology, uh, it makes a lot of sense. It can be very cost effective because it shares technology with combustion engines. So we have that whole supply chain for internal combustion engines all ready to go, um, you know, manufacturing at scale. So that's probably why this has uh, some keen interest. Yeah. Um, from the previous slide, uh, for the state equation, um, would, wouldn't P be a time-bearing variable, whereas V is constant? Ah, uh, good point. Um, so we should be switched between P and V because... Yeah. Yeah. Is that right? That should be switched indeed. Yeah, yeah that should definitely be switched. Okay. Do I get a free credit for changing your notes? <laughs> yeah, that'll be so that oh, yay. the the extra credit will it's actually on on the handwritten notes. Oh. <laughs> no, but 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 that's uh, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. That's that's definitely an error. Great, thanks. So let's move on to the thermal energy storage category. Actually, I, I just added this for the first time this year because uh, um, I think there's some new interest in particular types of thermal energy storage. So the key type of thermal energy storage that I want to introduce to you is so-called underground thermal energy storage. Um, sometimes this is known as seasonal thermal energy storage. Uh, that might give you a hint at the, at the time scales that uh, this, this operates. So um, here's the setting. We're specifically just talking about thermal energy. No electrical energy. Um, just just thermal energy. So it's used for heating and cooling. Okay. So here's um, here's the idea. Basically, uh, what's uh, so the specific type that I'm going to talk about is borehole thermal energy storage. So here's the idea. Um, what we're going to do is drill these long boreholes into the ground, uh, deep deep into the earth here. And the reason we're going to do that is because we're basically going to use the earth as this large thermal inertia. Um, so, so just like the flywheel is a mechanical rotational inertia, and we want it to be large because we can store a lot of kinetic energy when it's large, the earth is a big thermal um, inertia, an inertial, thermal inertial mass, if you will, right? Um, so the idea here is um, the, the Earth basically maintains a, a fairly constant temperature. So in the summer when it's quite hot and uh, we, we want to run um, some sort of cooling in the building, um, rather than doing heat exchange with the ambient air, which can be relatively hot, uh, we can increase the efficiency of cooling by using as a working fluid um, cooler, some, some sort of cooler fluid. So what we'll do is we'll pull from these uh, long boreholes in the earth um, some, some water, which is relatively cool, um, much cooler than, than the ambient air. And then that uh, fluid will run through a heat exchanger to cool um, the air that we'll use uh, for cooling in the building. And we can really boost the efficiency of... Um, our cooling system when we use this this cooler um, fluid and then the the excess fluid uh, that heats up a, as a result of our uh, cooling procedure will we'll then uh, do a heat exchange with that and then it'll go back down into the earth uh, which will cool it uh, during summer we we have something similar happening in in winter so when it's super super cold outside um, what we can do is uh, take uh, some sort of working fluid, like, like water, for example, and um, it, it's relatively warm in the earth because the earth maintains this constant temperature that is pretty close to, uh, it's basically 27 uh, degrees centigrade. And then we can use that as the working fluid uh, rather than the ambient air, like, for example, at uh, zero degrees Celsius um, when it's freezing out. Um, we can use, uh, uh, you know, the working fluid from the earth to then uh, do a he heat exchange with, with the air to, um, um, uh, to provide our working fluid for heating. 
So this is basically the idea. We're just using the Earth as a thermal uh, inertia. So uh, the energy capacity is uh, just, just given by um, this thermal energy equation, which basically says we have the mass of our working fluid, we have the specific um, energy, and delta T is given by the temperature difference between our working fluid and the space that we uh, want to cool or heat. So you can see that the um, um, uh, larger we, we maintain that, the more energy uh, we have. So the level variable is basically going to be temperature here. And the state equation is given by Newton's cooling law, which, which you've seen in class. Okay, so the round trip efficiency, um, this can actually sometimes be quite efficient depending on, on the build, sometimes less efficient. Uh, uh, okay, so I put a wide range here, it can be somewhere between 75 to 90 percent. So the response time is slower, it's basically how quickly you can get these fluids to run. It can be something like a minute uh, to an hour, um, actually more like a couple hours maybe. Um, and this is why it's used really for seasonal um, uh, storage. Um, okay, now the specific energy, specific power, the energy density and power density, uh, these are very much limited by, um, you know, the size of your boreholes. Uh, the power depends on the power of your heat pump um, that you need to push the fluid through the whole system. You know, the, the density of this whole system you can see we're using a lot of volume, right? Uh, so clearly this is a setting where, where you don't care about uh, volume. Okay, so this can be very cost effective in areas with high heating or cooling costs. So for example, in Northern Europe, Norway, Sweden, Canada, um, or um, uh, along the equator in Southeast Asia, um, parts of Africa, you know, this can be actually be quite effective. It's in fact a pretty simple technology. Um, but it's really effective only for seasonal energy storage. And, uh, of course, you're required to do this, uh, to drill these boreholes. And there's another version of this where um, um, you, you can also use aquifers as your thermal uh, storage medium. So, all right, this is uh, underground thermal energy storage. Okay, let me move forward to electromagnetic energy storage. All right, so uh, the first version of this that I want to describe is electrochemical capacitors. These are also known as supercapacitors. These are also known as ultracapacitors. They're all the same thing. Uh, uh, let me mention that these are different than um, your electrolytic capacitors. These are the small ones that you pay a penny for that you can get at an electronics uh, store and you can solder onto, um, you know, a proto board or you can plug into a breadboard. Those are quite low power. Um, these are high power, higher energy versions of of those, uh, uh, you know, classical uh, capacitors. So um, here's how it works. Uh, what we have is um, some sort of electrolytic uh, fluid inside this. Um, uh, contain volume. And inside this electrolytic fluid, we have positively and negatively charged ions that are floating. Now, in addition, we also have two electrodes, uh, which are labeled minus and plus. These are negative and positive electrodes. Now, if we apply a voltage across these electrodes, then um, we put a negative and positive charge on these electrodes, uh, respectively. When we do that, the positive and negative ions get attracted to the opposite charged electrodes, respectively. And then when it's charged, you, you get the picture all the way on the right, where basically all the positively charged ions or cations are attracted to the negative electrode, and all the negatively charged ions in pink, or the anions, are attracted to the uh, positive um, electrode. And, and then when you let go of, um, you know, the DC power supply here, basically it sticks, okay? There's no way for this to discharge. 
and, and there's a, a voltage that's fixed across this uh, capacitor. So the energy capacity is given by uh, this capacitor equation, one half CV squared. And the level variable is the electric potential or voltage across these two electrodes, V. And the state equation is actually what you've seen uh, in your homework, and um, I, I've described it in class. It's C times the time derivative of V gives uh, the, the current. Um, so this you can understand well by, by the following. When I let go of the power supply from these two electrodes, then no current flows between the electrodes. They're uh, electrically isolated. So the voltage stays constant and there's no current. So when I is zero, then the change in the voltage is, is zero here. And then C is basically like our, our inertia. It's our, um, you know, how much uh, uh, electrochemical charge we can store in this uh, electrochemical capacitor. By the way, you may have noticed a theme with the energy being one half times some inertia times the level variable squared. Mm -hmm. We had E equals one half I omega squared for the flywheel. Um, Kinetic energy for the hydraulics. Yeah, we have, uh, sorry, we're going to see one more example next for basically like an ultra, uh, a super magnetic energy storage device, which is kind of an ultra version of an inductor. Mm. Um, so we'll start to see uh, that, that pattern. And the differential equation is just the derivative of this energy equation. So this is pretty cool because now you can unify energy storage um, um, technologies. Okay, so these are in fact incredibly efficient, 90 to 98 percent. Their response time is super, super fast, um, you know, on the order of milliseconds. Um, okay, now in terms of specific power and power density, um, well, specific power in particular, um, they are uh, excellent. So you can get a lot of power out of these very quick. Um, uh, now their energy density and their specific energy uh, less so. So they can't store a ton of energy, but you can get a lot of energy out of these very quickly. So, so that's what I'm summarizing here. Excellent power density, um, but they have poor energy uh, density. So these make sense in an application where you need a burst of power. Um, so for example, in the power supply to, to, to my laptop here, um, if there's some surge of power from the outlet, um, you know, or there's a surge of power demand, uh, the, the power supply has capacitors in it which can basically smooth that out. So the capacitor itself doesn't really provide a lot of energy, but they can provide a burst of, of, of energy in a small moment to smooth things out. So they're great for that purpose. They also have very high cycle life. There's, uh, there's uh, not much that can break in this uh, system. Uh, right. Okay. And and actually, the technology in itself typically can only provide low voltage, like on the order of maybe one volt, one and a half volt. So to get enough voltage to do something meaningful, like charge your phone, uh, you need to put these things in, in series. Okay. All right. So let's move forward to basically, uh, no one calls it this, but it's basically an ultra inductor or super inductor. These are more commonly known as superconducting magnetic energy storage systems. Uh, they are in fact just uh, an extreme version of an inductor. Um, so you, you can note this by, we, we have basically the energy storage equation for an inductor, one half L I squared where I is the level variable given by the current that's flowing through this thing. And energy is basically stored as a ma magnetic field around this in inductor. And the key is to get uh, very, very high currents so that you can store a lot of energy. Similarly, in a flywheel, you want very, very high speeds. So, so this is actually similar. It's basically an electromagnetic analog to a flywheel. Now, just like a flywheel, you want things to spin fast. So you want low friction bearings. You want it in a um, vacuum. So in this electromagnetic version, we basically want superconducting coils. 
we had superconducting materials. Um, so, and typically to do that, you actually need to, uh, you know, when you go up very, very high currents, um, you have heat generation. Um, and so you need to cool this. So to get very, very highly conductive materials, you typically also need super cooling. So to make these things work, you also need super cooling. <laughs> And that's very energy intensive. So this is really a lab scale thing. But can you extract heat from it like you did for the... Yeah. The thermal? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great idea. You, you could use this for combined heat and power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which I'm really not going to talk about combined heat and power here. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a way to really make this make sense. But this is really still lab scale stuff. I mean, there's no commercial applications uh, for this. But I wanted to show you because it unifies uh, a lot of energy storage ideas. Okay, so the efficiency can be high when we're just talking about the uh, electromagnetic piece of it. The response time is super fast. Um, very high specific power, very high power density, less so energy density. Um, the key disadvantage, which makes this make no sense, in practical applications is you need to cryogenically cool the superconductive uh, uh, material. So yeah, you, you could extract that heat and use it, um, um, but typically to, to, to minimize the resistance in these uh, uh, devices to keep um, temperature high, sorry, to keep efficiency high, to keep resistance low, you want temperature to be super low, like as close to zero Kelvin as you can get. Okay. <laughs> but also when you want to extract the heat, um, some kind of metal device will be close by and due to the magnetic field, it could go damaged, maybe. Right? Uh, There's going to be a strong magnetic field around. Yes. And if you put some device near it, then I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You you have to right. You 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 will induce some. Um, okay, there's going to be a lot of magnetic, strong magnetic fields around it. So you want to contain that so it doesn't. Uh, yeah, it's complicated. So so it doesn't interfere with any other uh, devices. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, all I want to say about electromagnetic energy storage technologies. Now we're going to move on to chemical energy storage which is incredibly important because uh, liquid fuels are used a lot. Um, and in fact, uh, I'm going to segue into uh, electrochemical energy storage like batteries, which I'm sure many of you are quite interested in. So the first type of chemical energy storage technology I need to mention is compressed natural gas. We need to understand this well. Um, so Energy is being stored chemically in the chemical bonds uh, for, for petrol gas. In fact, what I'm showing here is um, isooctane, to be specific, um, and then natural gas. In fact, what I'm showing here, to be very precise, is methane. And uh, the, the way that we can get energy out of the chemical bonds that are in these hydrocarbons is by... Uh, inducing a reaction and this uh, reaction is typically combustion so you can see here for petrol gas we have this hydrocarbon where when we combine it with oxygen the byproducts are going to be co2 and water um, and in addition to that uh, we're, we're going to get um, a lot of heat which comes from combustion uh, which we can use to create pressure and power pistons to create mechanical energy and that's how engines work. Um, similarly, for, for, for natural gas here, um, we're going to pr produce CO2 and, and uh, water. Okay, now, this is all well and good. Um, the reason that people take uh, issue environmentally, uh, that is to say, with um, these hydrocarbons is because you necessarily create this byproduct, which is CO2, at least in these... Um, uh, nominal reactions that I'm showing here for isooctane and methane. And when we release CO2 into the atmosphere, um, this damages uh, the 
ozone. So this is a necessary byproduct. Uh, now something that's of interest here is, um, you know, what's the difference between petrol gas or isooctane, specifically what I'm showing here, and natural gas, namely methane, I'm showing here. Well, you can see for one mole of isooctane, I produce eight moles of CO2. Um, and then for uh, one mole of methane, I'm only producing one mole of CO2. So, so that's why in some sense, um, natural gas is cleaner burning, so to speak, uh, because as a byproduct for every mole, um, it produces less moles of CO2. Now here I'm saying 25% less moles CO2 produced per kilojoule of energy. So that's, that's in the unit of energy that's stored in the bonds of these two um, hydrocarbons here. Okay, so, so that's why natural gas is considered more environmentally friendly because it produces uh, less moles of CO2 per, per unit energy and per unit mole. Okay, so the, the energy capacity of our, of our fuel here is basically just given by the mass because it corresponds to the amount of energy that's in the chemical bonds here. And the level variable is the mass. And I have this very simple differential equation which says um, the rate at which we deplete the mass of our liquid fuel corresponds to the power that's produced. And alpha is just some uh, efficiency factor um, that's, that's appropriate. Okay, so the problem uh, with this from a round-trip energy uh, point of view is that it's typically less than 30%. Now, in some um, more efficient internal combustion engines like, uh, like, like a Prius um, or even some internal combustion engines that are used at the grid scale can get closer to 40%. But now that you've seen all those other numbers that are more like 75 to 90%, this seems to not make much sense from an efficiency point of view. Okay, now response time, I say millions of years. What I mean by that is that, so to store the energy, um, that basically means we have, um, you know, plant matter that will decompose and eventually turn into oil. Um, for which we can extract that and uh, refine that into uh, natural gas or um, petrol fuel. So, so that's what I mean is uh, the time it takes to actually store it is uh, not so useful. Um, although uh, once we've stored it as liquid fuel, it's relatively quick um, to, to get power. So that, that's what I mean by millions of years, though, the, like the round-trip response time. Um, okay. Now, yeah, question. Yeah, um, what does it really mean by round trip efficiency here? Like, how would you measure the round trip efficiency? What does 30 mean? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm being not so disciplined about my definition here. So actually, in this case, I don't mean round trip at all. Okay. I, I mean just from liquid fuel to, to mechanical energy. Okay. So huh. I just mean one way. Yeah, one way. And then, uh, yeah. And and then, still don't understand how you would measure efficiency like that. Like ah, so so we we would take we would calculate the chemical energy that's stored in these oh, okay. bonds. Oh, okay, I see. Okay. Yeah, and that's the denominator. The mm, numerator would be right, right. Yeah, just like the mechanical energy in an internal combustion engine. Okay. So you know, there's a lot of energy lost to heat, basically. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yep. Thank you. So, um, great. Thanks for those yeah. questions. <laughs> the, okay. So, but the key advantage is it has superb energy density, superb energy density. In fact, let me refer you back to the Rigoni plot. If, if we want to store energy, uh, in a small volume as possible, lightweight as possible, Liquid fuels are awesome. Okay, let me give another example. Airplane. Mm -hmm. Limited volume. We want it to be as light as possible. Um, in fact, if I had a jet fuel, it'd be a little further out than this red region, a little oh. further to the right. It's awesome as a, a storage medium. 
you know, for these app for these mobile applications. So, you know, but it, it comes with its distinct uh, disadvantages, right? Yeah. But um, yeah, one thing I really like to do in this class is explain to students who live in a world where they see a lot of media talking about the benefits of clean tech is to really kind of respect how fantastic uh, liquid fuels are in some respects, you know, and, uh, okay. So other disadvantages, uh, yeah, politically sensitive, right? Um, uh, not every place can locally source this, um, you know, but, but uh, a key advantage to mention on, on the bottom, on the left too, is that it, it's a relatively mature technology. Okay. Okay, let me talk about hydrogen. This is a quite an interesting, different type of way to store energy uh, chemically. Um, so what I'm showing you here is how we can create hydrogen, and then how we use hydrogen to create electrical energy. So um, hydrogen we can't mine. Hydrogen is the lightest element on the periodic table, so it just floats out into the atmosphere. Um, and it doesn't exist in its natural, in its pure form, right? We, we, we generally have to uh, create it. Uh, so one way to do this is with something called reformation. Basically, we're going to take methane, and uh, what we can do is when we combine it with water, and we have excess electrical energy... Um, we can actually use this to um, do a uh, chemical reaction, which actually consumes energy, um, which we can take methane and water and create um, hydrogen, and then we also create CO2 as, as a process. So, so this, in fact, is not uh, perfectly... It, it's, it's not clean in terms of um, not creating uh, CO2. That's one way to form hydrogen. Uh, you can also do something else called electrolysis, uh, where you take water and you can split H2O into hydrogen and oxygen. It's basically the reverse of the chemical reaction shown on the bottom here. This requires a lot of um, energy as well. So the idea here is, uh, for example, if you have a large wind power plant and you're producing more electricity than is being consumed in that moment... Um, so, so that's what's kind of shown on, on the right half uh, up here. So if you're producing more electricity than, than is being consumed at that moment, you could use that excess energy to, f to do electrolysis, to basically split water, H2O, into hydrogen and oxygen. And that's perfectly clean. So that's the preferable way, um, environmentally speaking, uh, to create hydrogen. Of course, you need the right uh, conditions for that. Um, but you can always do... Reformation, provided that you have methane available to you. So then when you have hydrogen, what's interesting about it is then you can combine it with oxygen and in what's called a fuel cell, you can create an electric uh, potential to power electric motors. In fact, Sumin, have you? Yeah. You, you've seen these buses yeah. around campus? Yeah, yeah. So, so what, what's interesting actually is a uh, Berkeley and AC Transit has had fuel cell buses for, I think, over 10 years. Really? Yeah. Uh, they're using... Uh, yeah, so it's not... You know, I mean, fuel cell technology is decades old, mm. and it's been in commercial applications. It's not always been economic. Now, AC Transit, about 10 years ago, there was a special program from the California Energy Commission where basically the state paid for free for these fuel cell oh, buses wow. okay. to make it more, uh, you know, to reduce mm -hmm. pollution in, in the city. They had a special program and money for this purpose. Um, but, but this has, you know, been around in Berkeley in these buses for um, well over 10 years. I have a colleague that told me the full story who was involved in this project, and, and now I forget some of the um, details. So, so in fact, it's uh, you, we may not see it at scale because uh, uh, the problem is basically getting hydrogen is uh, the, the limiting factor here, but fuel cells as a technology is um, 
um, it's not immature. Let me put it that way. It's not immature. Okay, so the round trip efficiency. Well, for reformation, it can be something like 80%. So that's basically to convert methane, those that chemical energy, into hydrogen. Um, so that's 80% efficient. And the fuel cell itself is like 40 to 60% uh, efficient. That is converting the chemical energy stored in H2 into electric power. Okay, um, so the... Yeah, so in total, not incredibly efficient. Um, the response time for reformation can be hours. For the fuel cell part, it's on the order of one second. Okay, so so in the bus, it's about one second. You know, this reformation plant that's converting methane into electric power, that's slower on the order of hours. Uh, okay, now it can have superb energy density, and actually I should be a little bit careful about this. Um, this is, so, you know, hydrogen is the lightest and least dense chemical there is, so it'll just go off into the air, but we can compress it to very high pressures, um, and when we do that, it can have excellent um, energy density, and this can be used in mobile applications. So. So, so that's why this is fuel cell vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, that's why it's interesting um, because we can get very high energy density when we compress hydrogen. And it can be a clean energy storage source uh, if we can create hydrogen from electrolysis. So this picture on the right here, not on the left. So in this case, it, it works quite well. Um, the key disadvantage is not in really the fuel cell technology itself. If you ask me, you know, if I work for the government and they said, here's a uh, hundred million dollars to invest in fuel cell technologies. Um, although myself, I've worked on fuel cells themselves. I would probably put the majority of that money into the storage of hydrogen. Cause I think that's really the key difficult part and, and less so in the fuel cell itself. Uh, yeah, storing it at high pressure. Um, is it just the cost of the container, the compressing procedures, the danger of it? Yeah, um, all those things. All okay. those things. There, there's even ideas where you can, um, you can store it chemically in a salt. Um, okay. Yeah, where it reacts with 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 other uh, materials. Um, there, there's some interesting, you know, novel. You know, research topics on on more efficient ways to mm -hmm. store this, uh, which don't require high pressures. Yeah, because because of the danger as well, and 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 you need energy to compress it down. Yeah, yeah, and then of course the infrastructure to to generate the hydrogen. Okay, so now I'm going to move into batteries. Um, uh, <laughs> now, in years past, when I talked about this, I I think I would uh, spend a while talking about batteries because. I work on a lot of battery technologies in my lab. Um, I think these days maybe uh, students will be more forgiving of me for going into more detail on batteries because I think it's become more dominant. Um, obviously in mobile applications for consumer electronics, obviously for electric vehicles, but, but increasingly so even um, in grid scale applications. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start out with a story, the history of batteries. So I'm going to take you to the north of Italy in the 1700s, where we find Luigi Galvani, uh, who was a physicist and, and a biologist, who had done a, a now famous experiment on a frog. Indeed, this is how the first battery started. So bear with me. It's, it's quite an interesting story, in fact. So he took a dead frog, and uh, he attached... Uh, two pieces of metal and wires to, oh, to, to measure the voltage, you know, across the frog's legs. Sounds kind of ridiculous, right? Yeah. So, so he, he, he did this, and the frog jumped to life. It jumped. To life? Well, not to life, okay. <laughs> but, it, but it moved. You know, it, it, right. it, uh, so, oh, I you know, I mean, he, he found this fascinating, obviously. I mean, he would, he, uh, you know, he wanted to understand what is happening here. So what he hypothesized or theorized 
is there was some sort of form of animal electricity. So, <laughs> yeah, that that there was even even a, a dead animal had some sort of energy source in it, oh. right? Um, so, so this was him going into electrophysiology. This actually was kind of the beginning of electrophysiology, which is like a totally different field today. Um, but, uh, you know, he was trying to understand the, the relationship between the physiology of these animals and electromagnetism. And he called this ga galvanism. Okay, so um, just as today... Researchers back then would write publications. Uh, they would actually write them as letters. And they would send letters to each other, to their colleagues. And that's how they'd share their findings. And then they would occasionally meet with each other at conferences um, and discuss their findings. And uh, back then, just like today, they argue with each other like crazy about their findings. Probably even more so because they're Italian. Um, they love arguing with each other. Uh, so, you know, he shared this with his colleague, Alessandro Volta, who was also in the north of Italy, uh, in Como, who was a physicist. And Alessandro Volta, who heard, who learned of Luigi Galvani's experiments, who read his letters, basically said, uh, Luigi, you have no idea what you're talking about. It has nothing to do with the frog's legs. Mm -hmm. It actually has to do with the fact that you connected two dissimilar metals to this frog. And the frog operated as an electrical insulator, but ions could still pass through. And uh, Alessandro Volta, to test his theory, mm -hmm. created what is known as the voltaic pile. What he did was he took zinc and copper, which are two dissimilar metals, mm -hmm. and then between them he put this electrolyte, which prevented electrons from passing back and forth. So electrically it's an insulator. But um, ions could, could basically move back and forth, kind of like the electrochemical capacitor that I showed before. And uh, he, he created, you know, named after himself, what he called this pile, uh, this voltaic pile. And he demonstrated that there was, you know, an electric voltage across this voltaic pile. Mm. And voila, the first battery was born. Uh, in fact, uh, maybe as a child, uh, you've done this experiment where you took a lemon yeah. and you put... Did you do this experiment? Yeah, it was like those one of those science packages that you play around. <laughs> yeah. You, your parents buy for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, do, do you remember uh, what, what, what they had in there? What the copper was and what the zinc yeah, was? Yeah, I remember like sticking something into the lemon and connected them with the yeah. like clipper things. Yeah, 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 to measure the voltage. Yeah. The, um, mm. what, what people sometimes use, at least in, in the U.S., is they'll use a penny because it's made of copper, mm. and then they'll use a nail. The nails are typically coated in zinc, yeah. and so they'll cut like a hole in the lemon, shove a penny in there, and then hammer a nail like into the other side, mm -hmm. and then you can actually measure a small voltage. Mm. Um, cool. Yeah. So that's... Uh, as kids, we were making voltaic piles. Mm. So, so this is the first uh, battery. So, so here's um, um, a more explanatory uh, schematic of what's happening. Basically, the key is you have two dissimilar metals, in this case, zinc and copper. And they have the property that there's a release of Gibbs free energy um, as ions move from one to the other. So, so what does that mean? That means that um, uh, uh, what, what happens is uh, electrochemically, uh, zinc, what's, what's going to happen is this, this zinc here is undergo this oxidation reaction where it creates this positive zinc ion, um, which basically eats away at this uh, zinc on this side. And it'll move towards... Um, uh, the right-hand side, the cathode, because this this electrolyte here is positively uh, charged. Simultaneously, on the right-hand side, you have this electrolyte, and there's these positively charged copper ions. Now, there's an electrochemical affinity of these positively charged ions to basically attach themselves to this copper cathode and, and build up. Uh, in fact, as an undergrad here at UC Berkeley, I took a 
a course in material science where I remember doing these experiments where over the course of like an hour, we could see that the zinc had been eaten away at and the copper um, um, was, was uh, building up. And, um, you know, while this is happening, we need to conserve um, electric charge because charge is basically uh, moving throughout this process. So to conserve charge, like none of this will actually work unless we have um, a wire connecting the negative electrode and the positive electrode and then um, current flows, namely uh, electrons flow um, from the negative electrode to the positive electrode and this powers your device. And that's how a battery works. Um, so, so that's uh, you know, a zinc copper battery um, which is not the type of battery that you have in any of your devices. Um, more commonly, we could have a lead-acid battery or lithium-ion battery. Let me take a minute to talk about lead-acid batteries, because this is what's in every car. Um, in fact, a couple weeks ago, I, I myself own a hybrid. Um, it's a Ford Escape hybrid. Um, so it has a high-voltage battery, but I had to replace the low-voltage battery. You had to. Yeah, because it, 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 it died. Oh, okay. Um, so the low voltage battery uses lead acid. <laughs> so even hybrid vehicles use <laughs> a lead acid battery for the purpose of like starting up the engine and uh, you know the um, like 12 volt electrical system. Uh, okay, so so here's a lead acid battery. Um, what it's what it's doing basically is is on is on one side you have um, lead and uh, sulfuric acid. And on the positive side, um, um, that's that's combining with the lead uh, sulfuric acid um, and and water, uh, and it's undergoing uh, the reactions uh, shown shown here. Now the energy capacity is basically given by how much lead is given in the the negative side. And, and it's actually a, a liquid that's flowing back and forth. So um, that's what AQ means, stands for a, a, aqueous, that's flowing back and forth. In fact, uh, it's, perhaps uh, you've actually had to, um, you know, refill your lead acid battery. And, and if you pick up a lead acid battery and shake it around, you could feel the, the, the liquid sloshing around here. So the moles of lead that are on the anode that haven't uh, reacted to move over to the cathode is basically the state of charge. So it's fully charged when um, we, we maximize the concentration of uh, lead on, on the uh, negative side. And the state equation is very simple. Um, here I'm representing kind of in a simple way rather than going into the electrochemistry. This basically just says that the rate at which the state of charge, which is the normalized energy, changes is proportional to the electric current. And Q is a normalization constant. All right, and that's the same, uh, that's, that's the equation that you have in homework one. Um, um, and it'll be the same equation I show for the other battery technologies. So the round trip efficiency for this one is like 70 to 82 percent or so. Um, the losses come from heat, uh, possibly other side reactions. The response time is relatively quick. Um, and in terms of energy density, specific energy, uh, I would say when you compare it to all the others, it falls in the moderate range. Um, roughly so for uh, power, power density and specific power. By the way, if we go all the way back to the Rigoni plot, here's where you can see the characteristics of all these energy storage devices uh, compared to others. So where is lead acid? Ah, it's here. Mm. Yeah, so we can see here it's uh, um, It's not the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's best is up and to the right. That would perform best in, in, in every respect. Mm. Yeah, so lead acid batteries are being phased out in, in a lot of senses. Mm. But why are they used so commonly? Lead is cheap. It's easy to source. Okay. Um, um, yeah, so it's low cost. Uh, the chemicals are toxic. 
actually, because we have these uh, sulfuric acids in them. Mm -hmm. um, they can exhibit thermal thermal runaway. It's it's less dangerous than lithium ion batteries in, in general. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, I, I think what's interesting is there are some folks who are working on advanced lead acid technologies rather than this baseline technologies. What's nice is they're very, very low cost. So there are some advanced lead acid uh, technologies that boost power, boost energy, mm -hmm. um, and maintain the low cost. So that could be of interest for some uh, stationary storage applications. Okay, let's talk about the lithium ion battery. This is um, the one we see at scale for uh, consumer electronics, power uh, tools, you know, if you talk to a, batter, a lithium ion battery manufacturer, they, they'll tell you they sell a lot for power tools. That's a huge market for them. Mm. Um, vehicles, of course, and today increasingly so for grid, grid scale energy storage. Mm. So what I'm going to show you is the lithium ion battery technology. So the cathode and the anode are going to be the following. The anode is a lithium carbon, okay, LIXC6. So when there's no lithium in there, it's just carbon, C6. So C6 is like graphite. This is what your pencil is made of. Um, um, and then we can lithiate it with, that's, that's what they say. They, they turn lithi, lithium into a verb. We lithiate it uh, with, with, uh, yeah, with, with lithium. Then the cathode is going to be some sort of lithium metal oxide. So, so that's what LIMO2 means. So we have lithium, we can lithiate this metal oxide. In M is some sort of metal, and there's different flavors of this, which I'll talk about on, on a future slide. Uh, so, so the cathode is generally what characterizes the different types of lithium ion uh, batteries. Importantly, we have lithium carbon on the anode. So when people say lithium ion battery, it means lithium carbon anode. A lithium metal battery has a pure lithium anode. I'll talk about that on a future slide here. So the level variable and the state equation are similar to lead acid. The moles of lithium on the anode uh, basically dictate um, how much uh, energy is stored in our lithium ion battery. And, and this is known in the battery industry as state of charge. And then we have the same state equation here. Okay. Um, Round trip efficiency is higher for lithium ion batteries, can be up to 98%. Response time is very, very fast, uh, faster than um, um, lead acid, a tad slower than, say, electrochemical uh, capacitor. Um, so it's on the order of milliseconds. Um, the reason that it uh, is very interesting these days is because it can have excellent specific power and energy. So um, that's, that's really why it's becoming more and more interesting. Um, it also has relatively high, uh, round trip efficiency. So for disadvantages, <laughs> it's funny, I've been using these slides for five years. So I think I've had high cost there for five years. So this is changing now. This is, this is changing a lot. And I'll show the declining costs of lithium ion batteries in some future slides. Now, one thing here is it requires careful controls. Um, careful management because we can get into thermal runaway issues. Uh, so I'm a controls guy, so so that's why lithium ion batteries are interesting to me. Do you mean it's going to burn and make fire, or that it's going to lose energy and heat? Yeah, if we don't carefully regulate how we, if if we overcharge it, or in particular, then we can induce some side reactions, which can. Um, basically short circuit the anode and the cathode and then we get a rush of um, ions flowing from one side to another which causes huge internal currents and when there's really large internal currents um, then we have lots of heat generation um, you know basically that goes with like I squared R and and what's interesting with batteries is when temperature goes up chemical reactions also happen faster yeah so Temperature goes up, and then that reaction that's already happening fast goes faster. Mm -hmm. And then it just becomes this positive feedback loop where at some point things melt. Mm -hmm. And then and then you have a Boeing 787 Samsung Galaxy Note situation. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, right. So we want to make sure that they... So controls are important to yeah. make sure that uh, that doesn't happen. So uh, let me now compare some of the flavors of lithium-ion batteries. Um, and the flavors are basically dictated by what chemistry is used in the cathodes, the different type of metal oxides. So um, I'm describing these by these so-called, uh, sometimes they're called radar plots or spider diagrams. I think they're pretty cool. A uh, pretty cool way to talk about the relative uh, features of things. Um, okay, uh, besides geeking out about the visualization, let's actually talk about what's there. Um, first, uh, l let me just mention that these are kind of, uh, these are types of plots that are used in business meetings. Um, they're not super quantitative. These are kind of more qualitative. So uh, excuse me for showing you these more qualitative plots. Um, okay, let me describe ones that I think are important. Lithium cobalt oxide is the the first mass scale lithium ion battery technology. This is what's in most uh, laptops, cell phones today. Um, what you can see is they have relatively high specific energy, which is why they're quite interesting. For power, you know, your phone or laptop doesn't need a lot of power. It kind of has just a, 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 a consistent and relatively low power consumption, but over a long period of time. Um, but its safety is uh, relatively low compared to some others. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. But uh, actually, one of the issues... There's actually, I'm noticing a typo. I've, I've shown this slide many, many times, and this is the CO2. first time I've seen. Yeah, this should be COO2, so cobalt. Mm. Um, okay, so, so one of the issues with cobalt, speaking of environmental sustainability, is about 50% of the world's supply of cobalt or more comes from the Democratic Republic of uh, uh, Congo. And, oh, I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. And so... Uh, these mines in the DRC, um, they use a lot of child labor. Mm. <laughs> so there's quite a bit of child labor that goes into producing cobalt for these batteries. Uh, so that's an additional reason why people want to move away from cobalt. Okay, let me talk about lithium iron phosphate. This is interesting because iron is much more interesting to source. Um, if you go to China, actually, um, the vast majority of manufacturing uh, battery manufacturing plants I see there are producing this type. Um, so it has great specific power, long life, high safety, um, you know, good in cost, a little less so in specific energy. Uh, let me emphasize on the lifespan and the safety for a moment. These things in my lab, I joke, are bulletproof. We try to age these things and it's super hard. They're just, they just don't age. They're, they're pretty bulletproof. Funny story, though, uh, you probably remember a few years ago when all these uh, hoverboards were catching fire. I didn't even know that they existed. Ah, uh, these, these hoverboards, you, you, they, they're, uh, uh, do you know what I'm talking about? The, um, Isn't that water? No. They, so they're, um, okay, they're, it's, imagine a Segway, but way smaller and there's no handle. Um, you, you put your feet on top of it oh, yeah, and they yeah, have two yeah, wheels yeah, yeah. and they yeah, got yeah. small motors in them. Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you, have you seen yeah, these yeah, back seen in, them. back in, uh, Korea possibly? Yeah. Yeah. But they're kind of dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they would keep catching fire. Oh, not only that, just in terms of mobility as well. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. They're just, yeah. yeah Adult they, toys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, yeah. Yeah. Younger, maybe adolescents use them and they can. That, but okay, so, yeah. so so I think they're famous in the news for actually the batteries catching fire. Um, interestingly, <laughs> they for the most part use this iron phosphate battery, which I find hilarious because it's the probably the safest one. chemistry. That tells you how hard they were pushing these things. Mm -hmm. So they sold them super cheap and they're using very cheaply manufactured mm -hmm. batteries and they're pushing them super hard. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so that's interesting. Okay, let me um, let me now switch over to. Okay, there's some others that are kind of interesting. Let me switch over to the upper right. 
lithium nickel manganese cobalt. So, so this is kind of a, a hybrid. It's got some nickel, it's got some manganese, it does have some cobalt. Um, these are very, very interesting um, because basically they have no weakness. They're moderate yeah. to excellent in everything. So this is the chemistry that I've seen used a lot in EVs. Mm. Tesla Powerwall uses it. Other, you know, I know Samsung is using it for stationary energy storage. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, in case you're curious, the Tesla cells for their EVs are actually nickel, cobalt, aluminum. Actually, it's a, a variation of this. It's actually these down here. Oh, no, they, they don't suffer care for safety. Um, <laughs> I mean, these are nominally what the technology is. Uh, Tesla does some other things to, like making a gigafactory to help with cost. And uh, yeah, there's some other aspects of this to deal with um, uh, chemistry. But they're, of course, very keen on this because of uh, um, specific energy. Okay. Um, all right, now these are lithium ion technologies. This is technologies of today, not the future. Let's talk about the future for lithium batteries. Okay, so what I'm showing here is the energy density and the, uh, so the mass energy density and the volumetric energy density. So it's how much energy these batteries store per unit mass and then how much energy these batteries store per unit volume. Um, okay. So up and to the right is where we want, uh, generally. So what I was just describing on the previous slide was this blue circle that says lithium ion. Now, what the colors represent is using different anode materials. So it's talking about these different flavors of cathode. If you switch out and use a different anode, uh, you can get higher energy uh, density. So the dark blue is a pure uh, lithium um, anode. Sorry. What I was describing on the previous slide was not this dark blue circle that says lithium ion. It was this, uh, it was this uh, beige or yellow circle with a graphite anode. That's, that's what I was talking about. If we go to a pure lithium anode, then this boosts some. Um, yeah. And uh, additionally, if we consider different type of cathode materials that some folks in the in uh, chemical engineering and the College of Chemistry are starting to look at, or Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and other places around the world, they're looking at adding sulfur to the cathode, that's what S is, or even having a pure oxygen cathode. These are uh, what are known as the um, lithium air batteries. Lithium air batteries are interesting because their energy density is the same as liquid fuel. But then wouldn't it be more dangerous to short circuit the, like the one that you talked about? Um, the short circuiting problem is probably no worse or actually even uh, better in lithium air. One of the problems with lithium air is the fact that um, the electrodes degrade and there are all these side reactions that happen um, that basically make it so that you can't get these to work more than a few hundred cycles. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the research is really focused on not getting these to work for just maybe 10 cycles, but getting them to work for tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. So yeah, nothing catastrophic generally happens, mm -hmm. but they sl but they degrade very fast. They, mm -hmm. they essentially disintegrate. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Okay, now this is not a future battery technology. These exist today. These are flow batteries. So these make sense for grid-scale energy storage uh, technology. So here what we have is two tanks that correspond to the negative electrode and the positive electrode. And uh, what we do here is we basically flow ions through this, um, uh, through this device where... Uh, the, the negative electrode and, um, interacts with this ion exchange membrane, um, and we have ions that can flow through this ion exchange membrane. It actually shares a lot of concepts with a hydrogen fuel cell. Um, and what's really nice about this is um, energy capacity, as I'll show on the next slide, because it, it basically is just given by how much uh, ions you can store in these different tanks. Um, so, so uh, you can store a lot of energy, but they tend to be very heavy. So for stationary applications, this can make 
uh, a lot of sense. So, so I'm showing some of the reactions here. Um, and similarly, the amount of energy that's stored in here is given by the concentration of uh, vanadium ions that are on uh, the negative electrode side or the anode side. Um, and the moles of that normalize gives the state of charge. So the energy efficiency is uh, you know, moderate. You can see it there. The response time is something similar to what a lead acid battery is. Uh, what's great about them is that they're quite durable. They have long cycle life. It's basically just pumping fluids um, around. Um, what's also very cool about it is the power and energy are decoupled. Namely, if I install one of these things, the size of my pumps gives the power density. And then completely independent of that, I can design the size of my tank, and that's the energy density. So we can decouple um, those. That's, that's unique. Uh, other batteries, technologies, we can't decouple the power and energy uh, capacity. Um, yeah, so it has poor specific energy and power. Remember, specific is per unit weight. So these things are quite heavy. So uh, not advised to put in your airplane. Uh, okay. Um, so, yeah, this, this describes um, the energy density of batteries and other different types of fuels. So, what's plotted here is the theoretic specific energy and the, the practical specific energy. So, if all these devices, all these technologies existed on this diagonal line, it basically means that they're 100% efficient. We don't need any um, balance of plant to operate these things. Um, okay, what's interesting about the slide actually is not those two axes. It's, it's the following that I like to emphasize. Um, liquid, uh, sorry, lithium air batteries, lithium oxygen batteries here, basically achieve the um, energy specific energy of like methanol and and very closely you know octane li liquid fuels so this is viewed as like a holy grail these uh, lithium air batteries if we can get there then it you know we could potentially even use it in airplanes for example um, of course there's less oxygen higher up in altitude you go so there's some issues with that but but anyways um, that's that's the trajectory of uh, battery research was it also high power? Um, they they can achieve uh, high high power. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. This plot basically shows the declining costs of uh, battery of of batteries. Um, so you can see years on the horizontal axis. What I'm showing on the vertical axis is cost. This is in units of um, dollars per kilowatt hour. So kilowatt hour is uh, our metric for, for energy. Um, this is a very busy plot. Um, I actually want to show it to you because I want to. if you really want to read more about the cost of energy, of battery energy storage, um, I want to refer you to this paper, um, which I put in B courses, uh, B courses under files which uh, talks about this and all the data that they collected to understand the declining cost of batteries and they use this to try to project forward um, what the costs will be. Um, let me mention that this paper was published in March 2015 so you can imagine when they actually did the research. Um, so at the time of publication the cost was somewhere around um, you know four hundred dollars per kilowatt hour uh, today, the latest numbers I've seen are closer to $220 per kilowatt hour, depending on how you define it. And the key thing that they talk about is if we can get this down to $125 per kilowatt hour, then we are on economic parity with liquid fuels. So putting aside power density or energy density, just economics, uh, batteries are economically at parity uh, with combustion fuels if we can get them to $125 per kilowatt hour, roughly. So this is a keen target for the uh, uh, U.S. Department of Energy. Um, okay, so 
you might be curious, where is the U.S. Department of Energy investing money? Um, I'm now realizing that this slide is relevant to our previous administration. Um, so it's a little uncertain what this will look like going forward. Um, but, but here they are looking at, um, you know, what, what are the different, uh, how does the cost break down for the different components of batteries? So the graph on the right, the, the first column here is basically batteries today. And you can see how this breaks down in terms of cost per unit um, energy. So this is pretty interesting because they're trying to figure out, okay, where should we funnel investment to bring down costs? So, so you can see here that uh, the cathode, in fact, is quite important. Um, there's inactive materials, so reducing this uh, is, is useful. Um, then as we move to more modern, sorry, advanced technologies with like silicon or pure lithium anodes, um, you know, we, we roughly get kind of the same uh, breakdown um, and, and the cost can potentially reduce in particular because the uh, energy of these devices goes up. Okay, now these are just projections, but this is how DOE was trying to think about where do we invest into it. Should we invest in the cathode materials, anode materials, um, pack integration, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now another part of reducing costs is manufacturing. So um, this is just for fun I, I wanted to share with you. Uh, actually, someone today at lunch from Lawrence Berkeley Lab was asking me, what is driving in these past years the reduction in cost. Um, there's a lot of good research happening, you know, things happening in terms of advancing the, the big thing that's really driving down the cost in these past few years is manufacturing at scale. Okay. Oh. And um, what so, was that in the graph again? Ah, I, I, I'm just showing the graph just this uh, decline. So, I, I mean, the there, there's no momentum in this, right? I mean, if we just continue doing everything we're doing today, these these costs won't continue to climb. We have to keep innovating um, to get these numbers to to go down. So the the innovations that got us from 1,000 to 500 are not going to be the innovations that get us to 500 to 200 mm. and to 200 to 125. But the innovations that have got us uh, from 400 to 200 dollars per kilowatt hour. Um, I'd say most of it has been driven by, by manufacturing. Um, but honestly, I don't think that's going to be what's going to get us from $200 per kilo hour to 125. I think that's where we need, uh, uh, more than Elon Musk and gigafactories. So, but, but let me emphasize manufacturing for a sec, cause it still plays a, a role. So what, what I want to talk about is manufacturing in the U.S., because our current administration is really interested in bringing manufacturing back to the U.S. So let me talk about the largest manufacturing plants in the U.S. Okay. So this comes in at number four. It's Mitsubishi Motors. Uh, it's right outside Chicago. And uh, by square footage in the floor space, um, it's 220,000 square meters. Coming in at number three is Boeing's factory that produces their wide-body jets. So this comes in at number three. Um, so it's not in the Midwest. It's, in fact, on the West Coast. Um, and actually, uh, as I understand, they're scaling this down, and Boeing is moving manufacturing to outside Charleston, South Carolina. So a lot of it is actually going to... Um, to South Carolina, in fact. Um, uh, this, the 787 Dreamliner, all of them are manufactured in South Carolina, outside Charleston. But still, this in square footage comes in at number three. Number two in square footage is actually in the Bay Area. It's in Silicon what? Valley. That's, the, that's number two in terms of a largest manufacturing plant. It's in California. So it's at 530,000 square meters. So now you can guess what number one is. It's the Tesla Gigafactory. So 
I think this is incredibly interesting because you can see here that the industries that are driving manufacturing at scale, American manufacturing, mm -hmm. is energy and clean tech, right? So, um, That's yeah, huge. this is yeah. This I, I think it's interesting to uh, know this fact that energy storage matters, um, uh, especially you know if we want to talk about jobs in manufacturing. Um, there you go. There's there's the the data. Um, I found this image. I thought it was fun. Um, that shows the size of the Gigafactory compared to some other um, um, they're monuments. All, they're all vertical. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's if the the Gigafactory were turned turned vertical. That's mm. that's how big it would be. Uh, okay. So that's that's the end of my lecture. Awesome. That's a good. Rip. That's a really good review of all the energy technologies. <laughs> Great, I appreciate it.